Welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, your host for the chats. I produce these chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Today, I'm in London, England, and I'm about to film a wonderful chat with Terry Hazelwood, a very prominent London leather man. I would like to extend special thanks to Carl Hayden, who's filming this and has come all the way from Dublin to do that. And also sincere thanks to Matt Spike, who's donated this wonderful location for us right in Soho. It's a beautiful day in London, and we're filming this outside, if you can believe it. Today is Sunday, October 21st. Terry Hazelwood, thank you. I appreciate you participating in Inside Leather History, a fireside chat on this beautiful day in London, in Soho. So tell us a little bit about your early life, your family time. Oh, thanks, Doug. It's a pleasure to be involved in this fireside chat and to get, to, get all our leather history into an archive like this. My early life, I think, is was is pretty bland or was pretty bland much like a lot of guys early lives it was a, a, a school a, a family a t two brothers uh, at my age of uh, 60 now there was not a great deal of gay imagery around in the UK at that time so uh, it was I went through the usual phase I think of a lot of guys as I was started to realize that there was such a thing as sex where I didn't quite fit in with all my friends who wanted to go out with women, and I didn't. So I think many of us go through that. Uh, and it was quite some time before I realised and began to accept that there was actually another side to sex, and that the bit that I wanted was not the same as everybody else's. So what was your first exposure to the concept of homosexuality? This, uh, surprisingly enough, it would be uh, a schoolmaster, a schoolmaster, not the not the not the stereotypical gym guy, gym hunk or anything like that. It was a history master, and it was a woman. Ray Chester's was her name, and uh, she was. I later found out a de uh, lesbian, and she was. She lived with her partner, oh. and it was. It's quite common for women women school teachers to live together and the idea that they would they would live together and do that and had a relationship and everything was that was my the first idea that this could actually happen how did the concept of lesbianism come up how did you ascertain this about her she told us oh my gosh <laughs> she did yeah we i would have been about 15 <clears throat> at the time and this this was quite a uh the school I was at at that stage was a, a, a state grammar school, which doesn't really exist so much in the UK now. But we had a very progressive headmaster. We didn't have corporal punishment or anything like that at school. And the idea that somebody's, if we asked a question, she would, they would answer it. So I did ask. That's, that's very heavy for that Time. It is very heavy for 1970, yeah, 1972 at the time. It was after we'd been reading uh, Women in Love in English literature, that's when it came out. My God. We did quite a lot of D.H. Lawrence and quite a lot of Lady Chatterley as well. So sex was all the rage, really, where we were. There was, there was no, uh, no problem with it that this actually happened. It's just that everybody else was quite happy with Lady Chatterley having it off with Mellors, whereas I wanted to have it off with Mellors. <laughs> <laughs> when we were preparing for this interview, you actually said you knew you were gay at age 11. I did, yes. I knew there was. Tell a, us about that. I knew, <clears throat> I knew that I was different. And there was, uh, and in, in order to get in touch with gay guys, or in order to get in touch with other other boys at that time of my age, I would very much threw myself into sport. I think this is quite common, and I was a, a cricket, big cricket player. Now, cricketers are quite big blokes, and a joint shower with the cricket team will, will conv really convince me that I was gay. How so? Uh, it was the sexual attraction I had to, to the guys. This, these guys were the guys I wanted to sleep with. Wow, and what about it appealed to you? 
it, well, it's, it's what what is masculinity? What did, that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. It was, it, it uh, they appealed to me because they were guys and not women. Is that answering really your question, or am I skirting around? No, it? but but to to delve a little deeper, was there? Did this? Did you bring this up with them? How, never, how did you confront this? Never brought it up with them. Never. I kept it like a lot of us. I kept it hidden for a long time. Okay. But I knew that that, that that I wanted to sleep with them. I knew that they were the guys that I was going to spend my life with if they were felt the same way that I did. I just wasn't actually sure that they did. And in many of them didn't. A lot of them turned out to be straight. In fact, most of them turned out to be straight. But so I was, it, was, it was a complicated relationship. We tried to work out how, how I would broach the subject of would you like to sleep with me? And that came much later, that came at university. But at such a young age, this is even before, presumably before you knew about this lesbian teacher. It would be about the same sort of time. Well, at 11, okay. yes, before I knew about the lesbian teacher. Yeah, lesbianism had not figured in my thoughts at that stage because women were not really part of my thought process at all, really. It was all being, a, being 11, 12, 13, if you like, I tended to take a very much a singular approach to it. Women didn't really come into it at all. The idea that sexuality could in any way be fluid and it may change through your life and all was was would have been a concept too complex for an 11 year old. Mm, mm, 11 yeah. year olds are thinking about oh well I need a new bike now so therefore or I want this is what I want and this is what I'm going to have so we're so if you wanted to sleep with a guy the idea that you might one day want to sleep with a woman or a woman and a guy or that two women might sleep together was just something too, would have been too sophisticated for me at that age. But did you truly understand that what you were feeling, that what you were experiencing was homosexuality? Uh, no, I don't think I did. It, what I, I, I realized, I saw it as the way I felt. Okay. I didn't try, didn't try and quantify it in any way. I didn't try and, say, oh, this is homosexuality, okay. or that anything else was heterosexuality. I just saw it as the way I felt. Oh, OK, OK. That came later to realise what this actually all was. OK. So this was just an urge you had, a, a sensation you had at that time without really understanding what it was? Quite, okay. yes. That would, be, that would be a fair assumption, a fair assessment of the situation then, yeah. Now you were in the RAF. I was. Please yes. tell us about that. That was that was from uh, 1975. After uh, just finishing university, I joined the RAF as an engineering officer. Uh, many now many people have this idea that oh, he's got into the armed services and everything. It'll be fabulous. You'll have all these guys to to, to do. <laughs> it isn't like that at all. It's fucking hard work, really. Or there's a lot of work involved. Uh, but. I think my main reason for joining was that there would be, at that stage, we wouldn't come across many women. And where I was on, uh, on our Harrier squadrons at the time, I spent most of my career on those, there were no women at all then. Mm. So this was, this was like a kind of a male world, which suited me perfectly. What were you doing with the RAF? I was an avionics engineer. How did that come about? Uh, I went to, well, that, it was the, I'd always been electric, interested in electronics, so that was the way I went, really. Okay. I could have been, it, I could have been, uh, it could have gone wrong and I could have been a motor transport officer or something like that, but it just happened to fall right. So it was okay, but as far as I was concerned, it was great. Okay, but that led to a lucrative career with British Airways. It did. So Once, take, take us up to that. Well, it's a bit of background here at the time. Okay. Uh, this would, we're now coming to 1987. At that stage, it was still illegal to be gay in the... The oh. Sexual Offences Act of the UK never applied to the armed forces at that time, or the Merchant Navy for that matter. So when they found some letters, which they inevitably would, and some photographs and everything, it was time to resign, time to go. So I was asked to go, and then I joined British Airways after that. Tell us about these letters and photos. It was I was having a uh, having a very 
long-term relationship with the navigator on another squadron on another station and we had written to one another and uh, some letters had gone astray uh, in the, in the, the way the mail system worked at that time I was living in an officer's mess and they were like pigeonholes with all the mail in and one of mine had gone and gone in another officer's pigeonhole and they'd opened it oh. and that was enough to do you know that was enough to do it and then once they got that, they did their search of the room and found photographs and all sorts. And then it was all over then. The, 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 as far as they were concerned, the game was up. How did you meet this navigator? Uh, we'd been on exercise in Canada and our eyes met across a crowded officer's mess bar, really. And I knew and he knew instantly, but we also knew we could never discuss it. We were like people would have been in the early 50s in, in civilian life in the UK mm. when it was still illegal because we were in a <laughs> society where it was still illegal, effectively. So, uh, yes, that's what happened. You mentioned a moment ago the laws about homosexuality changed in Britain. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. And you said it didn't apply to the armed forces. No, it, it, it was the Sexual Offences Act, 1967. Okay. It, and this, the, the, it became, the law changed at that time, prior to the 67 Act, all gay sex of, of any sort was illegal, whether in public, anywhere, in private, wow. anywhere people could be and were blackmailed for doing it. The police would raid people's private homes if wow. they suspected people. Wow. The 67 Act <clears throat> loosened things up significantly in that it suddenly became legal to have sex with your partner, but not in public. Now, the legal definition of public for the purposes of the 67 Law was in a house where they were just you two, just a pair of you. So a house of multiple occupancy, say you shared a room with somebody else, would count as public, so sex in that house would be illegal. Uh -huh. So by public, they, they don't mean as we are now outside. For the purposes of that, being in public would be in a house with other people. Wow. Children. Ch and certainly anyone. children, okay. yeah, anyone, other adults, anyone. Wow. It had to be two guys, in a house that was empty, essentially, and then it would be all right. Fascinating. Fascinating. That's the way to, but none of this applied to the armed forces. And why not? The total ban uh, applied across the... Because they believed, at the time, that if people were uh, having sexual relationships with one another, the main thing that panicked them was that they would be a security risk. Oh. Which, is, which I've never understood, because if you, the way things were, people could be blackmailed yeah. for, for yeah, and have their career ripped to pieces. So surely that would be a significantly greater security risk than allowing people to do it in the open. Hmm. Or allowing them not to have to live a double life. Fascinating. But that's really what, it, that's really what they were... And they were always convinced also there was the side that somebody who was a, a, a non-commissioned or a commissioned officer would would have a, has a certain amount of power over some of the over lower ranks, and they might use that to force them into some sexual activity that they didn't want to do. Uh. A situation that I've never understood, because this is assuming that a sexual dynamic will fit in with your military dynamic, and it didn't need necessarily be like that at all. Right. What work did you do for British Airways? Uh, I was chief avionics engineer on the Boeing fleet at Heathrow. My gosh. And I've just retired now, Richard, so I'm no longer that any longer. Wow. I kind of grew up with jumbo jets and I liked them very much. Were you able to travel the world? Yeah, yeah. Okay, lovely, lovely. I fly on a lot of Boeing aircraft. Yeah, I yeah. like Boeing aircraft very much. If I were starting an airline, those were the aircraft I would buy because they're easy to, to refit and rehash and turn them into flying operated theatres or freight or anything oh, you no like. no kidding. Wow. There is one in Africa that flies and does uh, uh, eye operations in Africa. There's three theatres on this, on this jumbo and it lands and they have people lined up for cornea replacements and all things like that where they can do them really quickly. 
for because this. the spares are easy to get and they're more they're more common really oh, there's, more of, them, there's more of them around the spares are uh, uh, available worldwide okay and the aircraft are for, uh, if, if you if i was starting an airline they would be what i would buy Fantastic. A second-hand Boeing, a second-hand couple of jumbos would would stand you in good stead. You could you could do go anywhere in the world with them. But let's come back to the London gay scene as okay. you knew it. You mentioned there were many bars when you came out into the scene. There were. My main one was the Colhern in Earl's Court. That was my favourite bar. Okay. At this point, we're getting to the into the leather scene side of it. I'd realised early on that leather was the thing. Leather was my fetish and always has been and I have never deviated from that at all. So, which is unusual, a lot of guys are into rubber and all sorts of things, but for me it's always been leather. And the coal herd was full of guys that looked absolutely fabulous in their <laughs> leather all the time and rode motorbikes and things and I rode a oh. motorbike at the time and it was just fantastic. It was a bit like cruising with Al, Al oh. Pacino. Mm. But why leather? How were you called to that? Uh, well, now we get to the abusing part of the tale uh, about what actually kicked me off. As I was explaining earlier, there was a, a time when there was very little gay imagery at all as I was growing up. They were not readily available. There was nothing on TV or anything like that. There were no magazines around. But there was a magazine called Exchange and Mart. Now this is like a prehistoric eBay. Like a, if you live in London, like a loot. It's a, a paper full of small ads where people wanted to sell things. Okay. Meet people and this is before Grindr or anything like that. Well, in the adult reading section of Exchange and Mart was a advert for the Leather Lean Gene Company and I've always remembered it. And contained within this advert was a Tom of Finlandesque drawing of this guy in these leather pants. Oh. And I saw that and the synopsis fired and that was it. Wow. That was okay. it. That was it. There was, it was, oh, that's, that's what I want. I want to be that guy. That's what I wanted. Because we all, that's what we all want, isn't it? We all want to be the person that we're seeing. How did you go from that to the full on leather scene? Uh, well, that took a number of years. I mean, this this would have been, I'd have been about 30. These jeans at the time cost 14 pounds, and they might as well have cost a million pounds. I didn't have 14 pounds. But from then on, then I had my first trip to the coal herd then, and bought my first leather article, which was an Arab strap. It wasn't a leather piece of leather clothing at all. It was the thing that went around your bollocks and your knob and that sort of thing to assist directions. <sighs> And it just happened to be leather at the time, and that was, just did it for me constantly. I was a, a, a frazzle. How did you even learn about the coal herd? Uh, I think I saw some, I was in London, in Earl's Court, and came across it by accident. There were a load of guys standing out. I didn't even realise it was a gay bar, thinking about it. The, the, the concept that a guy, that a, a bar could be a gay bar. It's not something that had occurred at that time, really. But I went by it, by it and looked in and thought, oh, that's a nice bar, I like all these guys, and I went in. And there were some magazines, a couple of, a couple of ancient copies of drama hanging around that, that's no longer with us. And a few, I think there might have been a capital gay at that stage, a capital gay newspaper about. And for a second, in fact, for several seconds, I was, oh my God, what am I doing in here? Do I really want to do this? Do I know what I'm doing? Is this all right? Is this for me? And it took me a while to become comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And at this time, I ran into Ian Allen, who would have been in his 30s at this stage, and he had a bike, and he used to hold Colt in the Colt. He denies it now, but he did. <laughs> he denies all of this, but it happened. <laughs> he denies everything. But we were there, and it was that was really good. I had the privilege of interviewing Ian Allen last year. Yeah, he's so a super guy, isn't Ian. he? Yes, he's just a complete. <clears throat> he's a mine of information, but he can hold court. Yes, and oddly enough, Ian was in the RAF as well. Yes, I know. Uh, 
Anything shocking about activities you saw in the bars at that time or certainly there was yes certainly in the coal hall there was an awful lot of people being given blowjobs and things and I, I whilst that new blowjobs happened I'd never actually seen anybody doing one but I'd assumed that they must occur because I wanted one done to me <laughs> so I assumed I, I, by this stage I had realized that I wasn't the only one in the world Okay. I think many of us go through that stage yeah. when we're very young that it's only me. Well, by this stage, I knew it wasn't only me. There would be other guys too. So what would they be doing and what would they be? But to actually see somebody in public doing it was a bit, wow, these guys are so out there. I'll never be able to do that. I would never be able to do that I was because I was still a bit repressed, I guess, at that stage. But, but uh, later, it, I sort of opened up a bit. What about, um, did you learn any new activities while you were in there? So, uh, something that titillated you or drew your attention? Uh, at that stage, it was, it was mainly the blowjobs that, that did it for me. There was nothing, oh and yes, there was one thing where this guy was shoving his finger up this guy's ass and rubbing his, his prostrate. Now that did it for me when the first time I had that done to me. And I could see that the, the pleasure on this guy's face he was happy to have. And that had never occurred to me that somebody would be able to do that. It sounds so naive, but this is a long time ago. This is pre... <laughs> you, we have to go back to a world of no internet, no social media, yeah. no anything. Yeah. When, it, when if you wanted to arrange a meeting with a, with a guy, you'd, you'd fill in the small ad and send your photograph off, and they would send theirs to you, and it could take weeks to an arranger... Uh, yeah. There wasn't the instant gratification that there is now. Uh, today's leather scene, the gay scene in general, is yeah. completely different from that time. You said that you feel your generation had the best time. I think we all feel our generation had the best time because it's the generation with the point at which we're young, the point at which we're discovering ourselves and discovering everybody else. Uh, I th so I think my period was the best time. Guys in their in their early in their teens and in their twenties now will uh, will say that their generation is the best, and so it is for them. In other words, there is no best time. It's the best time for you. Okay. I don't think there is any any really good time or or, or any specific period that's best, and everything else is downhill. I don't I don't go along with that idea at all. Older guys like me now will say, oh, well, of course, it's not so much fun now because we have the instant gratification and it doesn't take weeks to set up meetings and you want to see a guy and you expect him to be perfect and not have any spots and everything to be wonderful. But I'm sorry, the guy is going to pick his nose and everything else because that's what people do. <laughs> you know, that, this is what human beings do. We are none of us perfect. When you move in with the guy, he will leave the toothpaste cap off the chair. You will put the socks under the bed and you will wind each other up, but that's life. But, but if doing it on, a, on the grinder or any or social media perhaps, particularly now where you can change photographs, mm -hmm. so the photo you see might not be that guy at all. Right. And you may have sent him a photo that isn't you, so effectively we've got two virtual people chatting together. When you eventually meet, there's going to be an awful lot of disappointment. Tell us more about some of the other bars that you knew here that are that are long gone, maybe. My, my, my favourite club was the Block. Now the Block was was around in London a lot, and it moved from different venues, and it was really a very good idea and something I'd like to see more in London. I used to go when it was in a pub called Traffic at the back of King's Cross, and it moved to uh, its main uh, sort of. HQ, if you like, it was in Ballam, but it also had a pub in oh, Shepherd's Bush, and I can't remember the name of it was, but there was one in Shepherd's Bush there, and it was the same club, very much like the Back Street, which is very much like the the bar, the the meat rack bar in uh, Cruising, okay, very much like that. Back yes. Street's a bit like that. Well, the block was a bit like that, except not quite as full on because it would be different for different venues. The one at King's Cross was because the pub had a cellar, so, which, so it looked exactly like that. 
Fantastic. And now that was really good. And there was a, at that stage, we were still getting to the point where the police would raid occasionally. This is, uh, we're coming at, to the point now where AIDS is, is, is starting to occur. And, they, and local authorities are getting panic stricken that people are having unprotected sex left, right, and centre. All in the, uh, and so the police would come in and have a look around, or firemen would come in and on the, do a spot check, fire check, and fire extinguishers or something. But was this truly to squelch the AIDS epidemic, or was this harassment toward the men? This was, this was har harassment in a, a born of panic. I mean, bought because they didn't know what to do about AIDS at that time. They had so no prior idea. prior to the AIDS epidemic, these things did not occur. Certainly, they occurred, but they did occur. But it's just that we're, you see, we're getting back to the point of what was your best time for me? It occurred because it was the AIDS for other people. I'll say, oh well, that happened anyway, but I wasn't around then. But it did happen. Certainly, it happened before the Sexual Offences Act, when it was illegal. Okay. Pubs were raided all the time, as, uh, and as I say, people's uh, homes were also. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? It does. You bring up AIDS. How did you see the AIDS epidemic impact the London community? It, but I think, as in, uh, as in America too, it hit the leather guys particularly hard very hard. An awful lot of people got sick very quickly and I've been to far too many premature funerals. There was, because I think mainly because of the sexual practices we get in, but people were having unprotected, well, there was no such thing as unprotected sex, it was just sex. Right. And the, the worst you might get is a dose of gonorrhea or something. You take a handful of pills, it'll all be over. Yes. And that was, that was as far as, so there was never a problem. The idea of using condoms, I don't think it ever occurred to anybody. I suppose it must have done, but it never occurred to me at that time. How did you react to it? How did you react to seeing AIDS and what was happening? A panic stricken, I think. I think I was, I, I was panicked at the time. I didn't know whether it was, I, would, I didn't know when it was, when the friends started to, to get sick and disappear and I'd go and visit them in a Middlesex hospital. And somebody who'd been an absolutely beautiful guy was suddenly a, a wizened up person. I thought, well, it's me next. Clearly it's gonna to happen to me. It's happening to everybody else. Why wouldn't it happen to me? So uh, I got a bit sort of panicky at the time, like a lot of guys. And we were also put it up with, there was an awful lot of stuff in the media then going, oh, it's the wrath of God and you're yes, all, you're yes. all, you're all evil and everything's going to die. So, and you would get a lot of that in the street too, even in London. Or perhaps particularly in London because we were so visible. But uh, that eventually cleared. Eventually, as, as, as the, the penny dropped, that all these people, this, this disease is not actually going to go rampant through the community in general. It will affect us leather guys in particular, and gay men less so, but leather gay men particularly. Yes. It will hammer us. So it's, and suddenly the government really aren't going to do about it, a lot about it, so we better sort ourselves out. We better look after ourselves. And then the condoms came in and things started to slow. I'm paraphrasing here, but things started to slow down a bit. And the idea that you, you could have sex and not, and you could protect yourself. And then the panic faded a bit, from my perspective, certainly from, from whether it, whether, now that's how it happened in London. Whether it would have been like that all over the country, I don't know. But that's how it occurred in London. Mainly because there's more of us. Even then, there were, the, or then particularly, there was a very large gay community in London that, and small towns in the UK would not necessarily, they would have been like going back 15 years. Yeah, They'd have been guys yeah. in the closet. How different is the London leather community post AIDS Holocaust? Well, what's occurred is that the leather fetish community has become almost mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. becoming, there is less of a, and I, now people will disagree with me, but I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. I don't mind the idea that, that, that 
that I could go into I could go in my leathers into any pub, actually not necessarily a gay pub in London, and nobody really take any notice of me. Yeah. And I could walk down the street and people would go, "Oh, you look fantastic," but that's it. It won't necessarily <laughs> be abusive. Uh, so I think that's what's happened. It's become okay. mainstream, and it's as fetish in general has moved more into the straight community. Yeah. So that and we even have ads on TV now selling sort of whips and things for straight people to play with. That, not that they did, didn't always do this anyway, but now it's now it's being advertised. Incredible. Now there are magazines for it. So I th it's. Now, other people will disagree who don't live in London will say, oh, well, that's all very well for you in a big city like London or Manchester or Birmingham. Try doing that in some small place. Right. And they would be right. right. So I'm not in a position to argue or think they're wrong. I think they are right. Yeah. But you could, we can only go by our own, what we own, our own sort of experience. Yeah. Uh, but I think there is still, I mean, there's... Uh, uh, we're not 100% accepted yet, not anything like it. There is a long way to go, but we're certainly getting there. Things have improved an awful lot. When I was 19, chatting to a guy who's as old as me now, then, they were really upset with the Sexual Offences Act coming in and semi-legalising it because they said it took all the thrill out of it. Oh, fascinating. It's taken, you know, it's taken all, it's taken all the excitement out of it. Now, now it's, it's a bit like drinking when you turned 18. Yeah. Suddenly it doesn't matter so much. <laughs> Suddenly you're not kicking against society in quite the same way. You're not breaking the law, if you like. So there's a few guys thought like that. Tell us about London Leatherman. Uh, London Leatherman is, it, this year is in its 45th year. It's, it sprang from a group called MSC, the uh, Motorbike Sports Club of London, and it, it goes back to a time when leather fetish guys used motorbikes as a cover, really, because you could, you could, uh, you could wear loads of leather, as long as you were carrying a crash helmet, this gave you legitimacy. I, I am wearing all this leather because I've got a motorbike and society, oh, well, that's okay, he's wearing leather because he's a motorcyclist. In fact, it's not, that it isn't anything to do with having a motorbike. And we've moved now to the point where people are, in fact, more honest now, where they're just leather fetishists yes. and that's it. So we don't need the motorbikes any longer. So we changed it from MSC to London Leathermen. And Manchester did the same, went from MSC Manchester to Manchester Leathermen. It is a, a grouping in which I am trying to make much younger. I'm trying to encourage younger guys into it. This is difficult because there are so many other distractions now. When I was, when I was uh, 18 or 19, there, were, there was nowhere else to go and find out about this stuff other than to, to go out to a bar, like right. the whole like the block. There was nothing, <laughs> there was no social media, no grinder, no nothing. Right. Now there is. And it's no good trying to turn the clock back. And, and now guys could stay at home and watch it on, on their computer. They don't need to go out. Right. Now, so we need to encourage them. We, we need a USP to get them out. And I find that the actual social interaction helps a lot. To get guys out to go to, to, to see us at a club night. And particularly in London, we have the, they're spreading around now, but we have the leather socials, the first Sunday in Compton's. These are very popular. And they do get guys out to say, oh, you know, these are, these are people who are like me. Warts and all. <laughs> How did you become the president? Uh, I was, well, it, it would be, <laughs> I could skirt around that and say I was elected. But there you go. <laughs> but I won't. I know what you're saying. How did you get elected? I, it, I was asked to stand. The previous okay. president was standing down. From, uh, and he had been president for a long time and seen the club through its branding change from MSC London to London Leatherman. And uh, you could only be president for three years, and I'm in my second year now. Oh, okay. But Paul, Paul Turner, who was the previous president, was president for four years to give him that extra year to see them over the branding. And he asked me to stand. At the, his idea was that we could bring a new 
a, a new image to London Leather Men, oh. to encourage that. And we're still really at the stage where in many ways we have two separate clubs. We have a club from the older members and the club with the newer members. And the newer members are the ones I want to, to get on board. And as you were saying, Matt Spike gave us this fabulous venue. Well, Matt Spike is now part of London Leather Men Committee to assist me and assist ourselves in doing this. And he's made tireless efforts with decent images and everything to get guys involved. So I see it moving forward. Good. But when we were preparing for this interview, you said you're not a front stage sort of a person, that you're more of a background person. I'm not a front of house guy, I yeah. believe is what I said. Uh, it, so people have asked me years ago, would I like to have gone to stand for Mr. Leather UK, or would I still like to stand for okay. Mr. Leather UK? The answer is no, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm more, I prefer to more organise in the background. I prefer to be the guy who's the, the instigator of it all. Pulling the strings. Uh, well, I wouldn't see it that way, but yes, if you like. I like to be... <laughs> because I'd, I'm not the guy... I'd, I'm not... It's, it's no good expecting me at 61 to encourage somebody who's 19 to join London Leatherman. I can, mm. What I can do is set up the events and make it yeah. work to encourage them, but I'm, they're not going to want to come and see me, they, but they might want to come and see the right Mr Leather UK. OK. So that's really what it's about. So it's, in a nutshell, I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are your personal fetishes, interests? Uh, it, they are, it is actually still the finger up the arse. <laughs> I mean, not to put too far, it really is. I really are, but you must cut your nails. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is, that's really what does it for me. <laughs> I file them. You know, yes, cute. A manicure is essential. <laughs> that is my main thing. If you could go... So both to, to do it and to have it done to me. OK. You have plenty of emery boards to yes. keep those nails done. Sure, yes, done. keep those nails done. If you could go back in time, in your leather journey, right. in your, your gay history, any of that, is there anything you would change or do differently that you wish you'd done? I wish I'd been more honest with myself when I was younger. I wish I'd gone to the stage of, instead of going through the fear that, of worrying about what other people think, uh -huh. I wish I'd been more upfront and said, well, this is the way it's going to be and that's it. But in many ways, that's not a very good answer because you could say that about anything and about anybody's life and anyone, and I'm sure they would. But that's, that's really, it isn't anything I've done or not done, but I wish I'd done it more openly. I wish I'd done it earlier, perhaps, really. Yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. I wish I'd, I wish, just wish I'd done, but I think we, you were saying earlier about what's the best time to be gay and what's, the, or what do you, what do people, the best time to be gay is your particular spot in time. There is no, yeah. so if you changed it or if I changed it, it didn't necessarily have been the best time. Something else would have gone wrong. There are things that we don't know that would have happened. Right. You just can't tell, can you really? So you ha we are what we are and that's it. What's the biggest misconception about you? Me? Uh, that, uh, that's, that's, a, that's that's a bit of a that's, a, that's a tough question because uh, <laughs> it'll be that that I, t I tend to be a bit uh, I, I tend to try and overpower people and try not in not in that not in the BDSM sense but try to put over my views in front of everybody else and that I don't listen well I do listen I might not take any notice but I do listen. Okay, that's fair. It is. That's that's. And, uh, and, and <laughs> people will say you're not listening to me. You're not listening to our. You're not seeing it our way. And I will say, well, I am. It's just that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Hazelwood, President, London Leatherman. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'm so pleased to meet you, and so pleased to be here in London. Thank you, Doug, and have a. Have a great time while you're here. All right.